welcome all and thank you for joining us at this hour. We're going to stick to English uh, during this uh, session uh, as we have um, numerous members who are strictly English speaker. Um, we're going to start uh, without any further delay by uh, welcoming our first uh, guest today, Dr. Tariq Hazwani. Um, Dr. Tariq Hazwani is um, a person that I've been honored uh, personally to work with and to uh, actually observe uh, in real life uh, his great projects uh, and uh, contribution to the simulation world. Dr. Uh, Tariq Hizwani, for the people who does not know him, he is a consultant intensivist and pediatrics uh, at King uh, Abdullah Specialized Children's Hospital. As well, he's an assistant professor uh, of pediatrics at King Saud bin Abdulaziz University of Health Sciences. Um, he um, obtained a uh, simulation certification at uh, Bryan College of Health Sciences of the United States. And he chairs the Pediatric Simulation Education and Training Program uh, currently at uh, the hospital he's working at. And uh, he has numerous areas of expertise, uh, including simulation education in uh, both post and undergrad. He's uh, a very active member of uh, variable societies and simulation and non-simulation, um, like the Pediatric Simulation Society, the Saudi Society of Simulation, and Inspire. Uh, apart from his um, uh, highly recognized and appreciated clinical medical experience, he's an avid walker, and I uh, actually encourage you all to follow him on Twitter and his inspiring tweets about activity and walking, and I personally get motivated uh, when I read his tweets. Uh, without further ado, uh, we would like um, to welcome Dr. Tariq again, and he is going to share his experience, um, the first hundred steps and more in simulation journey. Dr. Tariq, the mic is yours, and uh, we're so excited to hear. Uh Thank you, Dr. Sara. Thank you for this uh, nice uh, introduction. Uh, actually, it is my pleasure to be with you and other colleagues, Dr. Amani and Saudi CSP for simulation in healthcare. Uh, and happy simulation week for all of you today. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah. Allah rahman rahim. Today, as you can see in my title, the first hundred steps and more in simulation journey. Let's start with a story. A few months ago uh, uh, happened with me uh, when uh, my colleague from simulation educator, he's a simulation educator and came to my office and said uh, sadly about his experience uh, with uh, his administration in his hospital. And then going in his details, he started told me his story. And he said when he came to the office of a CEO in his hospital and asked him, Mr. CEO, I would like to have 250,000 riyals for a simulator. That's what the answer he received at that time. How is that going to make us some more money in our hospital? Answer from my friends, he said, to educate the people, to make them more smart, and to reduce mistakes. Oh, we have a lot of smart doctors and nurses working here. You should be reducing the mistakes anyway. What's your return on investment for this job? My friend uh, answer, we are buying the simulator to train people to work together better, to work as highly functional, as a team working that will help us for all these issues. Oh, again, they are smart enough to work as this. They do it every day in their clinical practice. I guess many of us have this hard and tough negotiation with administration in their hospital. 
many of us, they are willing to establish simulation program from zero. So what do you think the best way and the better way to go to get approval of your administration to start your program from zero step? For sure, at any administration in healthcare, they are looking as a business also in the same time. When they are considering to buying, for example, ultrasound machine, MRI machine, other any machine in healthcare, they will say, how much will get back from this machine to increase our budget, to develop more and more in our hospital, for example, here. So we have to be smart. We have to learn how to stretch our program and to convince the stakeholders in he, uh, here. But for answering this question, because you will find later on maybe the answers for that, let me have another review about our institution over a day, uh, uh, overall nowadays. In each institution now, we have a quality safety department. And this department getting its data from where? From the provider quality data. Talking about nurses, talking about physicians, their skills, their quality of care they are providing here. As well, they are looking the data coming from the outcome of the patient. How much the outcome of the care in our hospital? As well, they are getting data from those incidents report. All of us, whenever we have safety issues, we are writing our incidents reports to improve our care. Nurses, physician, any health provider here. Then they look also for the cost data. The patient when receiving a care, there is a cost. Is this cost really fit and match the patient's need? As well, they are looking to the finance data. This finance operating the hospital itself. Budgets and and, 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 and a lot. And then they are looking for the outcome and measures. There is a measures telling us we are in the right direction or no. This measures coming some time, uh, some time from they are looking and observing us, external measures outcome, as well coming from accreditation institution, GCIA, and for example, here in Saudi Arabia, I'm talking about Sibahi, for example, here, they have a specific requirement, have specific measures, we have to follow it. As well, quality department looking for any threat here, any latent threat here. So all this data collected together by quality department toward what? To improve, to improve the quality of care, to improve our efforts here. So what they will do to improve this? So after this, the action following all this data and analysis, they will policies and the process of procedures. Through the process and the procedures and as well, the culture competencies. Then, Quality safety education. They have a lot of programs about the quality. In this way here, they, in this program, improving the individual competences, routine for our daily practice. Also, they are looking for individual emergencies. What I will be my reaction during emergencies as individual? Then they are looking for team competencies, emergency. How's the team working together during emergencies, a crisis? Also a routine. I'm talking for example, ER, 
I'm talking about uh, OR, for example, schedule and how the dynamic all of this. I just now, you will look to this now, data analysis measures and the outcome of it and the improvement, improvement pathways. You know now, I think, where is the simulation fit for among all of this? Simulation is touching all of this from the improvement effort I'm talking about. Simulation, as you can see here, touching the threat overall, any gaps, any issues can be threat for our care, as well touching the policies, procedures, competencies, quality program, also looking for individuals and team as well. I will not say that simulation is everything can or can solve all the bro uh, problems, but it is an essential tool here. We have to put it in the its right position, as we said. So it is the time to shift. It is the time to shift from the physician centers practice to the patient centers practice to improve our patient practice and our patient care. It is the time to move to the team dynamic, how we are working as a team. It is a time to move from our focus on the diseases and illness to focus about our healthcare quality here, not only to cure, also look to the quality, look to the higher level here. If I'm looking for all of this, do you think that the simulation is the solution for this or the simulation, the only solution for all of this? I will not say the simula simulation is magic and it will solve all the issues, but it is an essential tool in education in a training and system assessment and competencies. Simulation is an essential tool for all of this. Beside of other measures, beside of other tools here. Nowadays, simulation is not an option. Nowadays, simulation is essential like any other elements in our institution, like any other major factor in our institution, like staffing, like system, like fire alarm. Simulation is alarming us for a lot of gaps and potential threat here. And the simulation is in contribute significantly in the process to allow us to provide safe and high quality care. We can test many policies, we can test many procedures, we can force, we, 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 in safe environment before going to the real life, before going to the real care. So if I will start my simulation program, how I will set my program, how to start the first step, I advise you always when you are going to the stakeholders, we are, when you are going to your CEO, when you are going to your administration, to look for the, the problems and understand it and look also to solution, how you will put solution. What I mean here, when you are going to them, not to telling them, what you can offer. Tell them why they need the simulation. Answer the query. Look to the query, look to the gaps, look to the system, for example, assessment. Tell them why we need the simulation and how much important simulation. So let's go to the practice. What we will do? You can start with a simple, 
because whenever you are going to ask for a fancy lab from administration, you are expecting a small subway? No, if you didn't answer their query, if you didn't tell them why they need it here. What we did, we start with very, very, very small, simple, simple program, almost, almost zero co cost. From the, the gap we found it about our training programs here, cardiopulmonary arrest event. We dictate many gaps in it and the challenges. And then we set a program for this, put a solution for that through a very simple simulation program. We identify the threat here. We put the solution in well written program and the proposal with clear objective that what we can do with a sim simulation program here. If you look to this picture from maybe many years when we started, you will see our real nurses here, our real physician with real defibrillator. All is this dirty here on the bed, very simple, low fidelity. But after that, what we did, we make it an original space. This is the beauty because it answers a lot of questions about our reaction, about our skills, about our team dynamics. This is the one of the major advantages of insight simulation. So it is not needed a simulation lab. I can start my program without simulation lab. Then we put the emergency scenarios from our real scenarios. We repeat some events happened and occurred in our institution. And we need them to discover what happened and where the weak points, we have to improve it. We irritate their critical thing, how to work as a team dynamics, how to discover their gaps, their challenges and how to improve it and avoid it next time. Then it's not enough to convince the stakeholders. We collect all this data over a three years of very simple mock code simulation program. We collect all of this data, analyze it, and we wrote it in well written papers here and results and recommendation. Even we publish it. So look what we did and look what is the outcome from this very simple. What is the impact, positive impact, strong positive impact from this simple program here. After that, guess what happened? We get a great support from the administration, from our all stakeholders to initiate a full program here. Pediatric simulation training and education program. We get the approval, but as the way is not end here, as you can see here. We have a lot of steps because we are building a program from zero building a program step by step. So admission approval, we get it. Then the issues come with hard resources to provide the space, to look for a space, suitable space and equipment. You know the simulation lab is an expensive one. So we, we said, okay, if we will go for only two station high fidelity will be enough. I'm not depending only on the technology. Simulation is a, a technique, not technology. We choose with our administration, a space inside of our hospital, accessible from all the healthcare provider in our institution. 
So easy access, easy access. They here, they don't have to leave their work for one hour to go for another building or, or, or. It is inside, in the core of the hospital itself. Then we form a committee to what? Because we have to put the policies. We have to put our objective. We have to, to put our organization, the procedure and the operation. It need a good plan here. And we believe in our program with the team work. We believe that should be as a team, not person from this specialty or other specialty and that's you know. We believe to hear and listen for each idea around and see which one we can get a benefit to improve our program here. And after that, we face another also the next step, how to build in our faculty here. From where we will get those instructors, from where we will get those that are running the programs here. It's not an easy task to get all of this. What we did, we formed this committee from different specialty. We believe this is pediatric simulation program is not limited to physicians, is not limited to nurses, is not limited to one specialty. We gather all the other specialty. I'm talking about physicians, nurses, pediatrician, RTs, pharmacy, uh, ER, anesthesia, technicians. And we said, let's have representative from each specialty and set together and put the plan, starting by policies, curriculums, objectives, and the draft proposal for some program as initiation for this program here. From each specialty, we look for those potential instructor. They have willing, they have interest in the simulation. You said we can't come. We will be hand by hand to establish your program here. Let's see some details about this. So after we get an approval, the hard resources, we get it finally. We get our space. We got also the many cans, the, 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 the task trainer. We will go with some more details, how to buy our faculty. We start with those potential instructor, as I said, and then we initiate with the training of a training program for them to make them more familiar with the simulation. Then we put simple, simple program, simulation based programs, one from nurses, one from physician, one in situ simulation, one lab simulation here as initiation for this. Conduct workshops related to the health simulation in cooperation with our postgrad centers, with our university, with our hospital. We conduct many courses for critical care, for acute care, for a pediatric. And also from the beginning, we put a plan to conduct a research for a simulation here because we have to see our outcomes as a research also, to be documented and will documented also. And we maintain a good communication with the others, with the other society, with the other program, with the other institution, to exchange our experience, to learn from them, to see what's going around us in simulation. So, our program at the end finalize it with different levels, with different types. We have a basic technical skills as well beside high fidelity programs. We have a lab simulation programs, which usually running in the simulation lab itself, but we maintain and improve and develop extra inside the program. We like it. We have to reach everywhere. If they are busy, they have busy unit, busy work, it's okay. 
we will come to you. With very simple program, effective, telling them how much impact the simulation and their skills and their team dynamics. Going to them with low fidelity equipment, but with a good instructors to lead a very short event because it is busy unit, for example, sometime. Okay, for one hour, for a half hour. They will see how much they can change after one session or two sessions for a half hour or one hour. We developed also interprofessional programs. What I'm talking here about interprofessional, those programs involve different specialty. Let's take an example about it, pediatric residency program. We believe nowadays with increasing the number of residents, they have less exposure for a critical, for example, situation or for some procedures, okay? So we can develop a program, but looking for interprofessional program. So what we did, those pediatric residents, we sat with them, sat with them, put a program, what, what we need. When we went to the real, we make it interprofessional, we ask an RT to join this. We ask a nurses to join. So we have continuous regular session in our lab consists of junior resident, senior resident, RTs, nurses, mimic the same, the same sitting, for example, for on-call pediatric resident, when he will receive a call about respiratory distress or, or whatever here. So, they will feel they are a real, real sitting and a real also condition and clinical situation. So their reaction is much different here. Moving on, we establish also quality programs, hospital-wide programs, quality programs. One of the best example, successful example about it Central line, uh, infection, uh, central line infection related program here, simulation based, covering all the nurses in our hospital and see evaluating a brief of this program and both of this program. If you will look specifically for this program, CLAPSI prevention simulation based program. See how many services involved. Nurses, infection control, anesthesia, imaging, many, 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 many specialty here. What we believe with that, the impact it will be great by such this simple program, but covering all the hospital here. This program now running over now, we complete the two years of, uh, of this program with a good evaluation tool, pre and post, to compare the impact. So back, our program, as we said, is a multi-speciality program. It's not only speciality. If you need to be success in your program, don't label your program with one speciality make it as a team-based program. Nowadays, if I will go for each program and see from each program, let's see, for example, technical skills, basic technical skills. If you will see here in, X, uh, in this uh, images for airway management, I'm targeting here different people, as you can see, physician, with the RT, with the nurses here, with a simple procedure, but if we will repeat it for each resident come to us in our unit, you will see the impact of it. How many residents during their BICU rotation, they will do intubation 
It's not too, too much now with increasing the number of residents and increasing the number of fellows, for example, here. So sometimes the resident come, please. We need to learn about, for example, the other photo here, just the tube insertion. They will do this procedure. They will improve their skills. For this procedure is a real life, maybe they will face it when or not at all in their rotation. But now we are giving them a chance for that. Central line as well here. We involving on this, not only the resident. I'm not focusing about one team here. Back, back about starting here. What I said, look for challenges in the institution. Report is that we have a challenges with surgical airway for those they have difficult airway. Okay. And the administration looking, analyze the data, what happened, road cause analysis. So we found that our team need more and more training about this very, very, very rare condition here, surgical airway. I can't every time ask for a task trainer. The budget is not allowing us, for example, or sometimes it's take a time nowadays, the process for that. I need start program. Here come with innovation from our team, okay? They said we can create a module for a surgical airway. If you look in the second photo here, you will see this is our MED, made by our team, surgical airway. And here the physician practicing the surgical airway and needle here airway with a module and task trainer done by our team. We didn't buy anything from other company here. Not always the program need a task trainer, expensive equipment, not always need a very complex of programs here. Look to the simple idea and to provide a solution for that. We sat with our nurses, look what is the challenges. We found many challenges. We put a list, a list for that and then a priority. And we made some program for targeting our nurses, as you can see here. Early sign of respiratory distress. Extravisation management. The nurses having the knowledge about the extravisation, but each nurse, how many times she will face this in her real practice? Rare, we found when we review the event of an extravisation, they get panic. We know that the knowledge in their mind, but get panic with the practice here. Okay, we said we have this program, come to our lab for only half an hour. Only half an hour. And this is the example of the extravisation program here. See, they are practicing the extravisation, how to manage it here. The session half hour. So the nurse will come in her, during her break in a schedule for, with a booking, practicing an extravisation. When she is practicing, she will never forget it. After that, they will get the briefing session as you can see here. If you will look to this program, pure nurse is a program here. Even because this is not Intraprofessional here nursing, pure nursing program here. Without physician, without other specialty. The molage even for this hand come from the instructor herself. She is willing, she is interesting in simulation. She said, I will do a molage for this extravisation. Now she is an expert in an extravisation molage. So Back to our interprofessional simulation programs here. We believe we have 
to challenge our teams with critical situation. As a nurse or a physician, we know nowadays if we are relaxed, we are depend on our cognitive memory and working memory. But during a crisis, the working memory, it will be so crowded and sometime we will get mind of block or even we are not able to think very well here. Our goal from this interprofessional insight to simulation for critical situation, cardiopulmonary arrest, respiratory arrest, whatever here, but any critical situation to move with our participant from working memory to cognitive, to make it as a routine practice for them. So when they will face a real situation, the memory itself subconsciously will help them to run their critical situation. In high fidelity, another module. See how many programs I'm not depending on high fidelity. Many programs depend on task trainers or simple insight simulation, but we, we are not ignoring the high fidelity in same time. High fidelity, as you can see here, is not depending in the many cans itself. If you will look in, in details for this, this is a scenario done for our pediatric intensive care fellows. For very high level scenario, deep in details. This patient in here, you can see the ventilator bedside, intubated. Here we have EVD, real EVD, real monitor, real sitting. We are caring about the details, but in same time, we are not over to confuse them. We make it as realistic like what they are facing in our unit here. So with our real nurses and real artists, as you can see, this is the real interprofessional. Mimic, if you will come to this room in our lab, you cannot differentiate it from the real critical care or ER room because the settings the same and even the humans the same here. The manpower is the same, same RT, real RT, Real nurses. I'm not asking a physician, the junior physician, imagine yourself as a nurse and the practice as an RT. No, 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 no. Let's come together. We will learn also the team dynamic here. It's not only the knowledge test, it's not knowledge challenge, it's a team dynamic here. We can from the control, we have this is the real fidelity uh, many can see. We can control everything as you can see here and we can even, as any simulation lab, speak with them and give them hints or look for any cues here. So this is scenario based here. And here, the operator running the scenario, the instructor watching, as you can see here, and they are running a, sim a session by themselves with video recording here. After running our program, coming with another challenges. So we design a program, different level of a program, but come with another resource management. From where we will get all these items to our simulation lab. We don't have a big budget to run this program. So, we believe we have to minimize the cost because the simulation itself is costly, expensive. So we cooperate with all the wards, nursing service, respiratory service. We said all the expired item, please, we need it in our lab here. If you look to our store here, all this, expired item, ET tubes, central line, chest tube, needles, cassettes, everything. So we get benefit even from recycling, let's say here. 
but it's not only. Sometimes we need some task trainer. As we said about the surgical airway, what about the central line for another example here? The task trainer for central line. If you look to ER team here, doing their central line ultrasound guided. And this is a continuous program. Each week or each other week, let's say every two weeks, we have a session for central line. We need a module for that. So we did it by ourselves. So this is a phantom gel pad here with a vessels with a real feedback, real, sorry, back flow, blood back flow, and ultrasound guided. And we use the same central line, expired central line, new expired central line. So we can now every two weeks running a central line session here without concerning about the cost here because it is almost, almost cheap or almost zero cost here. We believe to improve ourselves, we have to link our programs with two important departments here, patient safety and the quality. Nowadays, the goal of a simulation to improve the patient care, to improve the quality of care and to improve the patient safety as well. So we have to integrate ourselves with the system, our system and hospital. And the most important system we have to integrate it, patient safety and the quality. So we have to identify what is their need, what is the organizing need, organization need. We look what is the quality program we can conduct it because here we can approve the impact of a simulation in it. We will, by this program, tell them how much value for this program, how much the simulation now value. So we prove to them that sim simulation is a, not an optional. It is now an essential, not for only education, not only for a training, is for aviation safety and the quality. Not only for that, even for our system check, for assessment. Simulation nowadays can answer a lot of a question about it here. And we can do it in two ways. A system level, retrospective. If something happened in an event, for example, happened, okay, and we detect, dictate, a gap, for example, or a three. So we can repeat the same scenario and see. Or prospective, we have a new policy, new process. Let's, uh, let us check it by simulation. In this photo, as you can see here, what we did it when the epidemic of COVID-19 started. Our quality department with our institution create many policies for patients with COVID-19. If the patient suspected COVID-19 came to the ER, how's the pathway? How's the team reaction here? Check the pathway from which room to which room and which corridor, for example, when we will call a chest X-ray, for example. We are looking for all of this and monitor it and put our notes here, our checklist done or not, and evaluation and assessment. It was very helpful to creating this a new system and helping to establish this a new system. Now I'm talking about checking and assessing the new policy, but as the provider level here, it can help as assessment tool for sure, yes. Let's back to the COVID-19. Uh, Many of uh, our... Hmm? Uh, just a gentle reminder. Uh, we have a few minutes uh, left uh, before we start our Q&A. Uh, okay, just because great. we received very interesting questions. Thank you. Great, great. 
So at the provider level, in the COVID-19 pandemic, many of the health providers get panic stressful. We made many programs here, mimicking a patient with COVID-19 and see where is their knowledge and the skills and behavior and attitude. It was helpful for that. For sure, simulation outcome need a KPIs and need outcomes. So we are doing our program and same time we are assessing and putting our program. Any simulation outcomes and KPIs need to start with our objectives and then critical success factors, looking at the institution, what they need from simulation. And for example, simulation in healthcare, need a com communication better, need a competency better, and need an organization assessment here. We can answer that. And then after that, we can set our KPIs, supposed to be measurable. KPIs to put real result and accurate result about the outcome here. Examples about the KPIs, number of a simulation project, number of a participant, number of a organizing units using a simulation and, and a lot of KPIs we can set. So overall, the key steps to success, be always open to ideas, approach and difference. Acknowledge the experience from different departments, from different uh, individuals, colleagues, your colleague, and support learning and the training. Aspire highest standard of profi uh, professionalism here, and always be con connected to the, collaborate with the others, with the other institution. Where we find our opportunity in our example, looking for our institutional data. This is a really as a very, very valuable source for your start. Look for this data, look how the simulation can help. Look to them, look to the challenges here. And look also what is the criteria and me measures from accreditation. For example, uh, society like Sibahi, for example. Nowadays, Sibahi integrated the simulation and their measures here. Look for networking with the others here and always be connected with the other colleague and other professionalism, uh, professionals. I will end with a summary for here. With these steps, always your design start to simple. Simulation is a technique, not a technology, and always provide a solution and put in your target, trainee target, multi-professional, not one specialty here. Be realistic, real, real settings with looking for details, not over, not under. Low fidelity is an important part in your simulation. It's not a mannequin only. Look for innovation for that and give your stakeholder objectives and outcome. Always, always build your team, be with them, fully support and collaborate with the others. This is my look for a simulation as a really as essential tool in a training, in education and in assessment. And this is our journey with our team, our lovely team, as you can see with our lab here, all of them saying to you, happy simulation week. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Tariq. It was a really, really impressive uh, presentation and seeing a project going alive and expanding this way is extremely, I would say, contagious along with your enthusiasm. Uh, personally, I've learned a lot, but I think the key point here is where to find opportunities to start your simulation is a very key slide to me. Um, usually we always wonder where to start or just copy and paste, but I think this gets us the buy-in easier and faster. Uh, plus that um, we should always think about starting small. We always aim really big at the beginning and then we get disappointed. I think yes. um, this is like a real life evidence of how things can progress really quickly. Um, we start with a PDS steps, I would say, baby steps, and then we would have such a wonderful, amazing, um, I would say, very reputable uh, program in, uh, in our hospital and nationally. Um, I have personally a few questions, but I've received a question here that I would like to start with. Um, 
They say, I think, and this is a lot of, um, it's an idea that concerns a lot of uh, people who are initiating a simulation program is how to convince simulation staff directors to start small. Um, that's the specific questions he comments after. Sometimes the problem is from ourselves, not from the stakeholders. Uh, yes, uh, I, I think it is most of the time that challenges come from ourselves, not from stakeholders. The stakeholders looking for answer for their questions and their query, but usually we are not answering in very good way. Stakeholders usually looking for a data and looking for a measurable outcome, not only as talking that we will improve and we will give you a solution. Give me a data about it here and give me specific data and the specific information. For example, here, when I'm coming to simulation field here, I would not say as a general word, simulation will help our trainee, trainees, will help our staff here. I will say in this particular, for example, challenges here we are facing, simulation is needed to improve the, uh, the quality or the level or the skills uh, from this point to this point here. Always be specific, be objective, not subjective. And after that, when you are providing them and justify them with a clear data, sometimes it's not our own data. Let's say we have a problem, but I don't have a program yet to present our data. At least if it is we have a similar problems, occurred in another programs, for example, and they have an answers by simulation with a clear data I can present it. Simulation can decrease, for example, a collapse rate by 10%, by 20%, by what, blah, 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 here. So I will be objective ways, not subjective ways. And I, yeah, I agree with him that most of the challenges is come from us, not from the stakeholder. Excellent. Um, I just received another um, question here. Uh, from where they have not to start with. Okay, I think uh, you have already commented or answered uh, most of the uh, uh, points that the gentleman is raising in here. I'm wondering before I go ahead with my personal questions, if our uh, esteemed panelists have any uh, question that they would like to direct it to Dr. Tarek? Uh, Sarah, P question with Prof. Boker, P question and answer. Okay, so here we are. Thanks for the great talk and sharing your amazing experience. That's from Dr. Boker. He's uh, the, uh, uh, I would say, the king of the Saudi society uh, of simulation. Um, he says, I think your friend question uh, is more from where they have nothing to start with. If you have a store full of simulation equipment, you can make the case because sometimes like inheritance, we have somebody already brought tools. This is easy. I'm wondering if you have any comments, uh, Dr. Tarek. Uh, I will uh, start with in the Prof. Boker uh, world. Thank you, Prof. Boker, uh, Boker because personal wise, I'm looking for him as a motivating one for, for us. Every time when I see his activities and his interesting and his motivation, uh, I learn a lot from him. Uh, as you said, he's the king of a simulation in our kingdom. Uh, starting with the question, what I understood from the question here, that we have a tools already, but we cannot run it or we don't know how to run it. This is the question, and is it right, uh, Dr. Azara? Um, yes, yeah, if you have, uh, um, I think uh, your friend question is more for they have nothing to start with. Um, in contrast to if you have the equipment, you can make the case, uh, uh, it's like an inheritance, you have somebody already uh, brought, well, already brought the tools and this is way easier. And I think he's trying to comment if we don't actually have anything and then starting from the scratch, um, I think that's what the question is related to as a comment to the previous uh, the, the previous question, I believe. I uh, don't know, Dr. Boker, if we get, got your point correctly, uh, feel free to uh, uh, text us again if I'm not getting it right. 
لا يقدر يتكلم اه تفضل دكتور بوكر السلام عليكم ثانك يو فيري ماتش دكتور طارق بيكوز اي ثينك ذا كويشن يو ستارتد ويز فروم يور فريند اتس اي اجري اف يو هاف سم اكويبمنتس هير اند ذير بت اي اولويز جيت ذس كويشن I think we've lost your uh, voice, Dr. Poker. Unfortunately. Uh, yeah, I think it's uh, what uh, Dr. Poker said, trying to say, if you have no equipment, uh, I think that's the hardest uh, case to sell in this so way. So you could go for a standardized patient program. You could go for um, B list, AC list type mannequins and make some of it uh, because you know like this is the part that we don't usually do the first or say the first five years of our program we made no purchase we just i think we're having a technical issue with dr booker's mic but i think the point he's trying to make is clear he's trying to list some options uh, in terms of like cost like the uh, so uh, if you start there And once the hospital see that you improve some of the projects, as you said, what is the problem? Look for one problem and try to solve it with a program using simulation. And you could call many experts in Saudi. Okay, the quality department or safety have a problem, this and that. I think I could do this or what's your suggestion? And you could come with zero money solution. Once you make these successes i think the money will be coming next and the support that's my advice to also to add to the wealth of experience that dr tarik uh, presented uh, during this great talk yes i agree prof boker about it that's exactly what we did we started with we started with bls manika yes i remember it and it was a five, uh, five or five years ago or six years ago And we prove from this very simple BLS mannequins, that's the outcome of simple program, it changed after that. And we get the budget after that, yes. We start, as you said, with zero cost in the first years. I agree 100%. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Dr. Thank you. Uh, Booker, for your uh, uh, comments. Um, I guess we have only uh, maybe a couple of minutes uh, for one more question. I would say that um, what were the key components uh, that you would consider the minimum to be any train uh, of a trainer program um, so you can run efficiently and quickly like a basic TOT? What were the component of your train of the trainer uh, program? Uh, we have from the beginning of our program, uh, a people's uh, health provider willing to join, but they like a simulation as a as an educational tool, a training tool, but they don't know about the, the, the simulation science itself here. What we did with them, first of all, we make we made the two days workshop with them, introducing the basic of a simulation, a terms of a simulation how to design our objectives, how to make it measurable objectives, and then how to design our scenarios, for example, here, how to, what is the high fidelity and low fidelity here, and then how to put our uh, assessment tool for our programs here. It's a simple way how to introduce a simulation for them, to make it lovely science for them, lovely way for them. And then with extra days, in our simulation lab, practice and the practice, we ask them to attend many sessions for an operation itself as a, a technician, as operator, as instructor, debriefing is an important part uh, uh, for, for debriefing, how many ways for debriefing and what is the uh, keys component of a debriefing. And still many of them, they continue auditing, audit, auditing our session before going to the real. Nowadays, last week, we are putting another plan for a train of a trainer because we have a new batch now with those that are interesting to join our program. 
we are going with the first workshop and then going to practice and the practice. And we are providing them with the full support for all resources and even advise them to attend uh, courses for a train of a trainers and even a programs about a simulation education itself to make them qualified even here. Uh, we have some of our members become now qualified uh, simulation educators. Excellent. Um, thank you again, Dr. Tariq, for joining us. And thank you for sharing this wonderful experience that is inspiring. And um, I think uh, a lot of us got extremely motivated to start their own uh, local uh, in-situ simulation program. Um, thank you again very much. And uh, we hope that you're sticking around in case towards the end we receive more questions. Um, and now actually um, allow us uh, the honor to introduce our second uh, speaker, Dr. Rajkumar Rajendram. Uh, actually, I was personally very impressed by the CV I received uh, um, regarding Dr. Rajkumar. It's very vast and it's, it's really impressive. Um, let me start by um, um, uh, listing some of his clinical experiences um, that he received at the prestigious school of uh, Oxford in UK. He actually had um, completed training in general internal medicine, anesthesia, intensive care. I could see from his uh, resume that he is very interested in ultrasound where he received a lot of like interesting uh, um, certification ultrasound like echo evaluation, life support, intensive care echocardiography and pleural ultrasound. And in addition to his impressive clinical qualifications, uh, he received uh, also a lot of training and certification paraclinical qualifications, such as uh, quality and safety, faculty development in medical education, um, health and safety risk management, in addition to other uh, non-medical qualifications. And um, with all that, he still finds a lot of time uh, to enjoy um, tennis and to have fun and a lot of activities with his four children, um, including karate, uh, badminton, netball, and football. Um, we are very honored to have you here, Dr. Uh, Rajkumar, and we are so excited to hear your presentation about the journey of Institute Simulation uh, from um, Oxford to St. Helena. Uh, welcome, uh, Dr. Raj Kumar, and the mic is yours. Assalamu alaikum. Hello. Thank you for um, a wonderful uh, introduction. And uh, thank you for inviting me to speak. It's a real pleasure to um, join you today from, from the UK. Um, so I'm going to be um, following on from a very uh, incredible talk by Dr. Hazwani, um, who, who's already spoken a little bit about um, in situ uh, simulation. And I'm going to talk a little bit more about some of the challenges uh, and the results that can be achieved by um, uh, in situ programs in lots of different settings from uh, where I initiated my um, journey in, uh, in, in simulation in Oxford, all the way to, to the um, tropical island of, of St. Helena. So let's see now. What I'm going to do is I'm going to be defining in situ simulation. I'm going to give you a rationale out for in situ simulation, um, discuss the use of this uh, very powerful tool for training, for quality assurance, for quality improvement, and then discuss some of the challenges and the obstacles that that um, you know I've had to overcome uh, in over the over the many years that I've been involved with this, and demonstrate the potential to improve clinical outcomes with um, in situ simulation. But before we do that, I'm gonna tell you a story. I'm gonna tell you a story about a Japanese act actress who um, was very upset. She was being interviewed on a talk show and she um, was being asked about her life. And she mentioned, you know, I've recently got a poodle, but but you know what? My poodle's sick. It, it, uh, it doesn't bark. It doesn't want to eat. You know, I'm, you know, I don't know what to do. So, you know, what she did was she, she showed a, 
a photo of this poodle on uh, on live TV. And you know, what what do you think is wrong with this poodle? You know, if there's anyone who wants to comment in in the chat, uh, please feel free. But this is actually a true story. Uh, this lady um, had purchased a sheep that had been shaved to look like a poodle. And, you know, this highlights the fact that, you know, you may have a lot of knowledge, you may uh, know a lot about um, poodles, you may know a lot about sheep, but if you've never actually seen one, someone can very easily pull the wool over your eyes. So, um, and this is really um, a very important point. This is the, the Saudi um, uh, equivalent to, to this uh, concept that basically um, highlights the importance of simulation and particularly in situ simulation. So even um, when you are uh, in your own environment, you can be very easily misled if you do not have um, experience of a particular situation or problem. So essentially with in situ simulation, you can develop the skills to deal with this issue. So you can develop technical skills related to uh, clinical assessments or interventions. And more importantly, and more uh, difficult to obtain in any other ways uh, is the training in teamwork and communication, situational awareness, communication, mutual support and leadership that can be obtained from um, simulation and particularly in, in situ simulation. So I'm going to show you an example of, of uh, an in situ simulation. So this, uh, this scene is from the film Crimson Tide and it uh, illustrates a weapon system readiness test on a, on a nuclear submarine. So I'm gonna play that now. The background to this is that the commanding officer has just been dealing with a fire uh, in the kitchen when the captain decides without telling anyone to initiate this weapon system readiness test. So that we can not hear the, the voice. I don't know whether you meant to show us the voice as well. Or... Yes. Yeah, so, so the voice should be uh, the voice should be playing. Uh, it is uh, there, but it's very low. So if, uh, you can put the volume a little bit up. Yeah, uh, the volume is now at maximum actually. Uh, you can do uh, like uh, when you go to um, share screen. And yep. then uh, advance, and then you can share your audio from there. So they kind of connect it. It's a new share. Oops. Okay, share sound. There we go. Can you hear the audio now? Yes, yes. Fantastic. Alpha, Alpha, Bravo, Echo, Charlie, Zulu, Tango, Alpha, Alpha, Bravo, Echo, Charlie, Zulu, Tango. Captain, message is authentic. I concur, sir. I agree. Message is authentic. Sir, your captain's missile key. Condition 1, SQ for WSRT. This is the captain. This is an exercise. Set condition 1, SQ for WSRT. This is the XO. This is an exercise. Captain, that fire in the galley could still flare at the time. Figure depth 150 feet. All stop. 
Make my depth 150 feet, all stop. Aye, sir. Weapons con, simulate pressurizing all tubes. Weapons con, simulate pressurizing all tubes. Con, weapons, simulate pressurizing all missiles. Aye, sir. Simulate pressurizing all missiles. Simulate pressurizing all missiles. So, so that was a phenomenal example of an in situ simulation, and it's going to highlight some of the the, the challenges and the uh, difficulties that we're going to discuss uh, a little bit later on in the presentation. Um, so, what is in situ simulation? It's a simulation that's physically integrated into the usual clinical environments of the participants. And it allows people to practice in their own hospital setting using familiar resources and equipment. Because often when you run a simulation in a simulation center, um, people are, you know, often struggle with unfamiliar equipment and, and the environment and not, not knowing the other people who, who they're interacting with. And this uh, sort of um, uh, takes away the focus from the equipment and the um, uh, interpersonal relationships to the actual environment of, um, uh, of each uh, practitioner. And the people involved will perform their own roles as if their scenario was real. Now, um, it's important that all disciplines participate, including support personnel. So, so pharmacy, physiotherapy, and, and, and uh, all the other specialties that would be engaged uh, in that environment. And, uh, and I would say, uh, in situ uh, simulations and center-based simulations are completely complementary, and you, you can uh, take the learning and experience from from center-based simulations and and utilize them um, actually when you're when you're doing in situ simulations. What are the benefits? Well, it can certainly improve reliability and safety in high-risk areas such as uh, intensive care units and the operating theater, and it allows. Um, learning and practice through experience, and particularly um, uh, focusing on teamwork and communication and crisis resource management, which are very, very difficult skills to learn um, uh, outside of this, um, this very controlled uh, inside you simulation environment. And it also can highlight uh, and address latent risks and system issues um, within uh, healthcare settings, and I'm going to talk through some of the the learning the, that I've uh, I've um, been involved with over the course of my simulation career. Now, one of the most important to think about is that actually, um, this is a Rolls Royce, and every Rolls Royce is a car, but not every car is a Rolls Royce. There is a difference. Similarly, not every team is a high performing team. A team is an independent group of individuals who share responsibility and a common goal. As healthcare professionals, we should aspire to be in high performing teams. And the difference is that these teams are stable and have uh, individuals with defined roles who trust one another, who share responsibility and values whilst having strong leadership and being focused on a common goal. So, so, so this video is going to show you what looks like, what, what, what a high performing team really looks like. And this um, is the, the Ferrari Formula One pit stop team. This, this is incredible and it's very difficult to see exactly what went on there. So I want to show you that again in slow motion.
So each member of the team performs their job perfectly without getting in the way of anyone else. And this uh, results in the perfect uh, pit stop and you know facilitates um, you know uh, a very good performance for the driver uh, in in the race. So how do you create a highly performing team? You have to create a stable team and coach the team as a team and not just as a group of individuals. Value cohesion get the individuals out of their sort of uh, individual workspaces and, and, and give them awareness of, of the entirety of the, the processes that are involved. And then you need to set effective performance goals. And this is really where Insight to Simulation comes in because it can um, uh, have uh, an impact in each of these domains and really uh, transform our teams from uh, regular uh, teams into high performing teams. So, so now I'm going to talk about um, some of the experiences I've had um, it, uh, along my, my journey for in uh, sim in situ simulation training. So this is um, the John Radcliffe Hospital in Oxford. And these are Osler's nodes, which um, I'm sure many of you are familiar with. And this, this is actually Osler Road, which is the road um, uh, leading to the entrance of um, of uh, the John Radcliffe Hospital, and you know Sir William Osler was was a was a very astute physician, and he has many wise teachings that um, are still hugely relevant today. And you know one of the famous quotes uh, that he made is, "Practicing medicine without books is like sailing an uncharted sea," yet reading. Uh, without seeing patients at all, is to is to not go to see at all. However, the challenge in the 21st century is how do we um, uh, allow um, uh, junior trainees to get this experience without endangering uh, patients? And and clearly, uh, one of the answers is is simulation. And um, and you know, when we when they do that in a sim center, it's actually very difficult for them to relate um, to their own workspaces and bring that um, uh, experience back to their own work because they have very little clinical experience. And that's uh, one of the things that we found was um, most beneficial when we uh, instituted a um, management of emergencies course for interns actually in situ. So within the emergency department, um, within the, the ICU, specifically focusing on the interns and their role as uh, often being the first responder uh, being called to assess uh, patients who have become uh, unwell. Um, uh, another um, uh, in situ simulation um, was used to um, test the processes for out-of-hospital cardiac arrest on uh, the hospital grounds. And this is actually a very, very uh, low fidelity uh, system uh, for uh, inside your simulation that provides a huge amount of information about the way the cardiac arrest team functions in this in this setting. And this is um, uh, very simple to do, very low cost, and um, uh, has a huge impact on uh, improving patient safety. Yes. Now, um, uh, we also did a uh, 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 inter-hospital transfer training course um, uh, in Oxford that um, was done in two in two parts. So we had a sim, uh, center based uh, course that um, uh, brought healthcare professionals um, uh, from around um, uh, various departments around the hospital together. But then we also did in situ simulation within specific um, intensive care units just to highlight, OK, what are the logistical problems? and the team working uh, issues related to uh, transfers within your, um, within your department.
departments. And, and this photo, um, before, we, before this photo was taken, actually, um, we did a, a trial run to, to, to set up the course. And we realized that this corridor was full of junk. And it must have been incredibly difficult for people to um, transfer patients in and out of the, um, of the departments because there was so much, um, so many uh, obstacles in the way. So I actually bore the course. And it, but, uh, but when people are working in that environment, they just get on with it. They just deal with it without actually um, thinking about how they could make their lives easier. And, it, and some, sometimes it's very difficult for them to say anything. Whereas actually, uh, you can see that this is now uh, uh, all uh, clear and it's very easy for the, for the, um, the team to move the patient. However, there was one, one uh, other area that was highlighted by this photo, which is that the, the person who's actually um, at the head end of the patient, where, you know, where the tubes um, uh, are and who can, who can actually see all the, the cables, is, is walking backwards. And, and actually, you should do everything that you can to avoid this happening because, because um, uh, this is uh, endangering patient safety. So the patient uh, who's, 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 who's at the head end of the patient uh, being transferred should always be walking forwards so they can see any obstructions in the way and see any um, uh, cables and things that may, may be caught uh, on any obstacles. Um, the first time people do uh, emergency endotracheal intubation, it is extremely stressful. And um, we, uh, again, set up an airway emergencies course in the simulation lab. And one of the things that we were trying to, to um, promote the use of was a, a, a rapid sequence induction checklist. And people coming on the course would, would say, basically, you know what, this, uh, this is fantastic in the simulation environment, but actually in our environment, in, our, in, in actual, uh, in the emergency department, it would never work. So um, we actually uh, set up the, um, the course and, uh, you know, moved, uh, did the, the course in the, the emergency department as an, in, as an insight use uh, simulation. And they were actually right. It was very difficult because they, you know, it was, they they found it difficult to access the um, the checklist. So, so one of the solutions that was made as a as a result of that was to actually produce these um, uh, these cards to fit in uh, into the the name badge holders that um, actually have the checklist on them, so that they were easily accessible, and so that. Um, uh, People could familiarise themselves with the checklist uh, when they had when they had a, a few minutes spare. This photo also highlights one of the other the uh, problems that that we uh, recognised is that when people are you know unfamiliar with uh, intubation, they they try and do it in in very strange and awkward postures. So so we highlighted okay you know in this environment um, uh, this posture. Uh, means that it's going to be very uncomfortable for you if you don't intubate the patient straight away. Uh, you're going to struggle. So we 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 demonstrated different ways of uh, of positioning the patient within um, within the emergency department. So that was very very helpful for for them. And you know this is a a picture of a much more controlled uh, endocrine, endocrine intubation after. Um, uh, people have been on on such a, an insight you uh, simulation course. Okay, moving on to the intensive care department. So this is a, a very very um, a, a useful um, uh, thing to do in uh, in ICU because there are so many different specialties that may be engaged uh, with uh, an unwell patient and um, and and. Uh, getting people uh, together to talk about some of the uh, challenges that they face when they're when they're doing it, and then running through a simulation that actually um, uh, tries to highlight where the problems are, where things can be um, done uh, to to uh, improve the situation, and um, and engage with all the different stakeholders and give people a voice who would normally 
uh, not be um, uh, listened to is, is a very uh, powerful tool for improving patient safety in really very high risk settings. Um, uh, this, is, this is one example of a, uh, um, a multidisciplinary uh, uh, non-invasive ventilation uh, sim uh, in, in the ICU. And uh, there uh, you can see actually two physiotherapists uh, within the um, uh, ICU actually uh, uh, doing what they would do if they were called to assess a patient who was uh, experiencing respiratory distress uh, on uh, the intensive care unit. Now, COVID uh, uh, has caused many, many problems. And certainly uh, this restricted um, the in situ activities that uh, we, were, we were able to do um, uh, because actually the physical space within the, uh, the departments was all being used for patient care. So um, we still use the same uh, uh, scenarios uh, in the simulation center. Uh, however, you can see that the realism and the learning is, is obtunded because you're, you're outside of that um, clinical environment. But, um, but as I've said, the in situ and the center-based uh, simulations are very complementary, and you can take the learning from, from one uh, space into the other um, uh, very easily. And you know, so this is uh, this is a very uh, low uh, key uh, component of the this simulation was to to include the donning and the doffing into the scenario, uh, because actually when people are really stressed uh, that's when they can make um, mistakes with uh, donning and doffing the, the their personal protective equipment and that increases the um, likelihood of them getting an infection particularly uh, in this um, uh, situation where they are about to um, uh, initiate aerosol generating procedures um, so so uh, we've gone from sort of very uh, low fidelity um, uh, in situ simulations to really very advanced uh, in situ simulations now. So um, uh, this is actually um, uh, a photo from from um, East Sussex Healthcare Trust, where my sister is actually a currently a simulation fellow, and um, they actually set up a, an in situ simulation within an operating theater to test their new major hemorrhage protocol. And um, you can see um, there, is, there are a large number of people within a theater with a, um, a simulator. Um, and this involved every uh, specialty from the uh, hematology labs, the biochemistry labs, the blood bank, um, the porters, um, the uh, anesthesia technicians, the anesthetists, the surgeons, um, uh, and it was extremely helpful in ironing out um, some of the teething problems with their um, major hemorrhage, uh, major hemorrhage protocol. Um, this uh, is uh, another um, uh, photo from. Uh, uh, East uh, Sussex Healthcare Trust, showing them setting up uh, their maternity um, in situ simulation. And it shows them actually uh, setting up a, um, a camera so that they can actually video the um, uh, in situ simulation to um, provide even better uh, feedback and debriefing on, on the situation. So, one point to make is videoing um, uh, inside your simulations is extremely challenging and, and very sensitive because um, actually uh, there, uh, there may be um, patient, other patients, actual real patients within the environment, other healthcare workers going about their business who, who are not involved in the simulation. And um, uh, it's important to explain and carefully prepare um, uh, the uh, 
the uh, sort of clinical um, uh, charge nurses and um, leadership of it within that um, within that unit to ensure that um, this is done sensitively and appropriately. Um, I just also wanted to to demonstrate to you that actually some mannequins can be extremely lifelike. And the quality of uh, mannequins has actually improved substantially in recent years. And this uh, is actually a double-edged sword because um, within it improves the certainly improves the realism of the scenario. But uh, other uh, people who are not involved in the scenario may be extremely concerned by uh, what is going on, and certainly other patients um, may not realise actually it is a it is just a mannequin um, and. Uh, this is again something that needs to be handled very sensitively. Um, now, coming on to to Saint Helena, um, this is a, a very interesting uh, place. It's a a tiny island in the South Atlantic Ocean, and um, very isolated. Has a population of about five thousand people. Now, um, this uh, island is uh, famous for uh, two things. Uh, it's famous for, for its coffee, and its coffee uh, is considered one of the best in the world. Uh, it's actually, uh, it sort of originated from, um, from Yemen and was brought to uh, St. Helena, I think, in the 1800s, where it was uh, cultivated. And um, uh, it is, uh, it's very expensive. And, uh, and Napoleon, who is the other uh, thing that uh, St. Helena was, was famous for, um, considered that the only good thing about St. Helena is the coffee. And he should know because um, after uh, he was defeated, he was, uh, uh, for the second time, he was uh, exiled uh, in uh, St. Helena and actually died uh, on the island. Now, um, this is the hospital uh, in St. Helena. It's a 30-bed hospital uh, in uh, the capital, uh, Jamestown. And uh, I had the uh, pleasure of uh, working there for um, uh, a few months. And whilst I was there, uh, um, Public Health England actually arrived to uh, advise the St. Helena government on um, healthcare policies and procedures. And uh, this was relatively shortly after the Ebola outbreak um, in, uh, in around sort of uh, 2015. So, so when that happened, and when you know, I was there, we, we just uh, got talking and we thought, okay, why don't we stress test the, um, the response of uh, the St. Helena Hospital to a potential um, uh, highly contagious um, disease. So, so actually, the cost of this simulation was almost zero. All the, the people were sort of engaged, Public Health England were already there. I was, um, I was there. So one of the, the sort of um, the visitors from uh, Public Health England, um, one of the infectious diseases specialists, pretended to be a patient who had uh, landed um, uh, on uh, St. Helena, having been through uh, several countries in West Africa, uh, sort of uh, on, on holiday, and uh, was now complaining of sort of general malaise and was getting some uh, uh, sort of bleeding from, from their nose and eyes. And um, so essentially, the, the concept was to, to um, uh, run a simulation of the uh, isolation facilities uh, in the hospital and the, the sort of responses of the staff uh, to a potential highly contagious disease. And to be blunt, um, it was the, 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 the simulation was a disaster. The, the, the response was awful. And had it been a real patient with viral hemorrhagic fever, um, the, all the healthcare workers in the hospital would have died 
uh, uh, or would likely have died, and um, as a result, uh, spread uh, Ebola to um, to most of the population who would have been wiped out. Now, uh, the 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 good news is that no one was harmed in the simulation, and it highlighted many, many, many of the uh, failings within the system. And um, the, the uh, administration of the hospital and the, the, the government actually, um, uh, to their credit, took on board everything that we uh, highlighted and made a lot of changes to, um, to their policies and procedures and uh, increased their, the, the uh, awareness of the staff of um, how to deal with um, potential uh, contagious diseases. Now, um, just to touch on the potential uh, benefits of this in situ simulation that, that um, cost almost nothing. This is the, um, this is the uh, number of patients with um, COVID-19 uh, in St. Helena since the beginning of um, the pandemic. You can see that um, of, the, uh, of the population, a total of two people uh, actually got COVID-19. And, um, you know, this is uh, phenomenal when we think of, you know, uh, places uh, around the world who are having um, uh, many thousands of cases a day when they uh, recognized that these, uh, these people um, uh, who had recently returned from a flight from South Africa may have uh, COVID. They were isolated immediately. And uh, as a result, um, only two patients uh, over the last sort of 18 months um, uh, developed um, uh, COVID-19. And it has um, been uh, granted a coveted spot on, on the green list uh, in um, uh, in the the uh, UK uh, travel uh, traffic light system. Uh, unfortunately, Saudi Arabia is still amber. Saudi Arabia has also done very well, but you know you can you can see that that two cases uh, is is actually a phenomenal uh, achievement. Now, um, what sort of simulations can you do in situ? Well, uh, this is really up to your imagination, but. It, I think it's very helpful to replay real events that have occurred in your units and that are likely to recur again. You can also uh, think about uh, some uncommon uh, scenarios, but they should be uh, serious emergencies that require rapid recognition and response. So, uh, for example, um, within the theatres uh, or in the uh, intensive care, a uh, can't intubate, can't ventilate situation. And this allows fine tuning of existing processes um, and training of staff on uh, new protocols. So uh, as I highlighted, the use of a uh, emergency intubation or, or, or rapid sequence uh, checklist. Um, uh, I didn't show any photos, but, but in when I was uh, working in Buckinghamshire Healthcare Trust, um, we uh, we did do some in situ simulations for prone positioning. Um, uh, this was started um, before the COVID pandemic, and it was actually uh, well timed because it then meant that the staff were very familiar in uh, how to uh, do prone positioning because we were able to to actually um, do any of the in situ simulation training uh, during the pandemic. Now. Um, the components of in situ simulation uh, scenarios uh, I've, I've listed there, and they are this, the, this exactly the same, exactly the same as uh, sim center scenarios, briefing, uh, facilitation of the scenario, and, and debriefing. Um, the scenarios should include a clear clinical context, and not all contexts are equal for, for training purposes. and. And what you, we need to do is actually decide um, what behavior we want the team to, to perform and then design the scenario to elicit that behavior within their, um, their clinical environment. 
the briefing should occur immediately before the simulation. Um, uh, and uh, as with any other uh, sim, uh, explain the purpose and the ground rules. Usually uh, will take around 10 minutes. Uh, invite the participants to treat the sim as an exact uh, as an actual patient, but explain that the focus is going to be on how the team communicates and uh, performs, and give uh, information about the time of the simulation, the use of the equipment, and 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 the 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 rules of engagement. So, so video recording can uh, be a very useful tool. It facilitates reviewing the, the performance of the team uh, during the, the debriefing, but because of other patients and staff, it is extremely challenging to do. And actually, it um, hyper uh, stresses the situation because patient uh, participants can feel very anxious about the, the video recording. So, so it's better to do it in a very subtle way and explain the purpose of the recording, which is actually to facilitate the debrief um, before actually starting the simulation. And uh, if you want to, to use um, the videos for any of the purpose other than debriefing, so if you want to, to use them for educational training, then it's important to um, ask the participants to, to sign sort of waivers allowing you to, to do that. Um, Well-designed scenarios include um, three to five events, um, too many, and it, it becomes difficult to, to manage and to debrief afterwards, and too few the scenarios over almost before it began, really. <clears throat> the trigger, is the incident to elicit the team behavior. There are some important distractors that need to, um, <clears throat> to be included. You know, for example, loud music in an operating theater or uh, an, a bystander who's asking irritating questions. And consider what uh, responses uh, should be appropriate to each uh, event so that you can uh, move the scenario uh, on at appropriate phases. Um, the simulation facilitators are going to be primarily uh, observing and they're going to introduce a new information as a sim uh, simulation proceeds, but, but try to avoid scripting the sim simulation too tightly because it's, it's very difficult to observe targeted responses to a specific trigger because you know, there's more than one way to skin a cat. As a lot, you know, if if um, the um, the team responds appropriately to a uh, a response to to a to a trigger, um, uh, allow the simulation to progress. Even if you feel that the the answer isn't the one that you you would have chosen, and uh, uh, and and this will allow the teams to recognize and adapt to changing circumstances. Now you need to keep the sim going for a pre-specified period of time, typically sort of 15 to 20 minutes. And uh, then at the end, debrief <clears throat> to help the participants understand uh, complex team skills and the knowledge required for, for, for patient care and give them a structure to understand the scenario to try and help everyone um, get onto the same page and take away very similar lesson, lessons. And uh, then focus the discussion on events relevant to the learning objectives that you highlighted and designed deny, design scenario around. Now, typically you, you need about three minutes to debrief every minute of the sim. So, so a 20 minute sim run sh should take at least one hour to, to debrief. And that's not including the time needed to review the video uh, if a sim is actually recorded. And um, it's probably a good idea to reserve a separate space of the debrief that's away from patient care areas so that so that um, uh, uh, other uh, people uh, can't actually hear um, what may sound like criticism um, of the, the staff who are, who are treating them. And um, uh, it, this is particularly important 
uh, if you're going to screen a, uh, a video uh, of the, the sim, you're going to need somewhere where that, that can be watched. Now, um, the other thing is to note that, that in an inside you sim, you're using the, the staff who are on duty. So, so you need to be time sensitive. And whilst um, typically you might want this amount of time, you may need to, to, to focus on the most relevant salient points that you want to highlight in the, in the, uh, in the debrief, uh, because taking an hour after the simulation uh, may not actually be feasible. Um, it's important to, to involve all the team members uh, who um, participated uh, in the simulation into the debrief and primarily focus on team performance and focus questions on you know, what uh, the participants thought about their team working and their communication skills. Don't overlook clinical and technical issues and you can use a debrief to quickly clarify an issue. But if you feel that one of the, the um, participants actually needs remediation, then handle that outside of the debrief individually. Don't do that uh, in front of um, uh, the entire team within the uh, clinical environment. And in some ways, it may be better to consider a dual debrief, focusing one part on the teamwork and communication and a separate part on, on the cl clinical and, and technical response. Um, but uh, these will depend on the scenario that you've chosen and the learning objectives that, that you've actually highlighted beforehand. Uh, uh, just a gentle reminder, uh, Dr. Ranjadram, uh, the timing. Uh, yep. So we'll get some time for uh, the questions. We'll, uh, okay. So I will um, speed through uh, this actually and highlight actually some of the challenges uh, because actually this is this is perhaps more important. So planning and logistics. So so I highlighted two different um, uh, simulations with very different fidelity, and um, so in situ simulation is not is not all the same. You can get a huge amount of learning from very low fidelity, uh, and um, the planning and the logistics are totally different. So um, uh, a out of hospital cardiac arrest sim with with a single mannequin uh, requires very little planning and logistics, whereas the in theatre um, major hemorrhage protocol sim requires a huge amount of effort and and uh, and work. So so there are many technical issues regarding the use of the simulator, how you're going to get the, the equipment into the into that environment, the medical supplies and the equipment required. Are you going to use sim equipment or are you going to use the the um, equipment from from that location? Infection control is critical, particularly in the, in the COVID era. This is a very labor in, intensive um, uh, project for the SIM team. You know, you're going to need transport uh, to transport the equipment to, to, the, to the clinical area. You're going to need to run the SIM, uh, maybe record a video, and then you're going to, need to, to, to remove the equipment and then take it back. So actually, this is, this is very labor intensive. Um, the, the units that benefit most are high acuity and high patient load. And the in situ shim, sim should certainly stress the system. But as I highlighted in the in initial video, you need to be very sensitive. You know, uh, the, the simulation in the uh, uh, nuclear submarine where they've just been dealing with a fire, where, where a patient was very unwell and they, they actually um, had a cardiac arrest, uh, is perhaps too much stress on the system um, to run, to run uh, a, a scenario. So be sensitive to the stresses in, that are already in place and uh, be aware that there may be a delay or a perception of delay in actual patient care. So um, there may be uh, some cultural obstacles. So, so families may, uh, may feel uh, that uh, their confidence in their healthcare provider is undermined if they are seen to be requiring simulation training. But with uh, explanation uh, to patient advocate groups, they may actually support the use of sim training when they realize the benefits to patient safety. And obviously you're gonna involve those who are on uh, active duty as participants. So, so um, to overcome these barriers, it's important to, to tailor sim, the SIM to the local environment and the multidisciplinary staff. 
Okay, and ideally have a dedicated equipment storage space close to the, to the, the unit where you're going to do the sim. Um, you need to rapidly put up and take away the equipment. And actually this can, um, uh, converting uh, the sim space back to usable, a uh, usable patient care area adds realism to actually the, the, the simulation. And can also improve the functionality of the space that you actually used because people say, well, actually, you know what? That wasn't, that wasn't set up very well, but, but this was actually better when we did the sim. And uh, uh, now this is the other problem that actually when you want to set up an insight simulation uh, program, you know, uh, you'll want to do insight simulation for everything, but actually you have to use the right tool for the right job. And often uh, uh, insight simulation may not be necessary. Um, and this is important when you try and engage the leadership um, and administration and define a shared vision for the program of training and be clear about the purpose. So is it teamwork development um, rather than uh, individual performance evaluation? and identify concrete training goals. And you need to ensure that the staff are trained in useful uh, methods for teamwork and communication before you start your program of insight your simulation so that the team have a common language and communication framework and so they're not just uh, demoralized by the, by the whole experience. And involve uh, all the, uh, the disciplines involved in patient care on the units. And um, we'll skip over uh, the, those two and highlight the logistics. So you also need to create a, a schedule for SIM training, align that schedule with the unit's vision and um, uh, staff participation in, um, uh, in, in that, um, in that uh, situation. Plan for transportation of the the equipment to and from the unit and set aside time to do all of this and, um, and ensure that the unit is aware that this is the amount of time and uh, that it's going to take. So um, now, conflicts with patient care. We need to actually designate clear standards and limits for actually conducting the simulations on the unit. Scheduled uh, insight use simulation may need to be cancelled or end early. And don't be put off by that if actually the unit is too busy or is just unable to cope. Um, then actually that's a learning point that you need to, to highlight later that actually we need to do something about this because this is actually bordering on dangerous if you cannot actually cope, if the system cannot actually cope with an additional um, simulated patient. What would they actually do? there was a real emergency in that situation. Okay, um, now we need to think about what data we're going to, to uh, then uh, evaluate and you know, consider taking data from uh, safety culture surveys, uh, evaluation forms uh, from uh, participants and quality feedback from, from the staff and use other measurement measures to track the impact of the simulation program. And uh, I've got some of the possible measures that can be used there. So, so how um, precise was their performance? Did they make the correct diagnosis? Was the treatment appropriate? How long did the, did the process take? How many patients were, were seen? And, and how much, how efficient was the system? system? You know, were you resources used effectively? Okay. And, you know, uh, it's important to have an insight use in working group. And this is particularly helpful if, this, if the working group is unit based, if it's multidisciplinary, if it's actually integrated into the quality improvement um, uh, processes of the unit and linked to incident reporting and, and patient safety initiatives, and also um, integrated with mandatory uh, training uh, and uh, involve those who are responsible for credentialing um, and uh, orientation of staff um, and perhaps those who are um, responsible to, for familiarizing staff with equipment that is very rarely used or, or new equipment. So for example, um, uh, we, we obtained a new uh, 
um, difficult airway uh, management um, device, a video laryngoscope, and we actually integrated that into the inside you simulation so that um, so that staff would be familiar uh, in how to use it and how to get it and how to um, uh, utilize it most effectively within that their clinical environments. Is there any uh, evidence to support the use of in situ simulation? Well, you know, certainly mannequins outcomes don't improve, but patient outcomes um, can clearly be improved. Several studies have demonstrated that, that in, in different acute settings, um, teamwork training with in situ simulation can improve knowledge, uh, teach practical skills, enhance communication, and optimize team performance. So, so uh, in summary, um, Insight simulation can uh, improve uh, individual participants' technical proficiency and improve uh, team behaviors and identify active and latent uh, system issues uh, that uh, can be uh, improved uh, and optimized. And it can actually be a catalyst to actually change uh, clinical care systems to and improve uh, clinical outcomes. So, um, so the next step for those of you who want to uh, establish uh, uh, such a program is, is to obtain support from, from, from the administration and leadership and uh, develop um, uh, participation criteria, choose some scenarios, plan the logistics, secure some equipment and pilot on a small scale before you uh, implement on, 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 a, on a widespread um, uh, basis throughout, throughout um, the units. So um, thank you very much. I'll, uh, I'll take some questions now. Thank you very much for this uh, enriching uh, presentation, full of information. Uh, certainly the troubleshooting part is like a very precious part because this is what we stumble into while we're building our uh, different programs. Um, I would just like to start with a nice comments from Dr. Barata. If you say uh, the staff are actually, or the people are the most important equipment you can have. And there are tons of low cost hand, like handmade mannequins. The first questions that we got here, what is the role or needs uh, of us as simulation specialists in those developing countries? And I assume that he's talking about your um, Santa Elena experience. Yes, yes. So, so actually, um, as has been highlighted uh, in the previous talk um, uh, and, and mine, um, and, uh, and the, the fantastic comment that you've made, actually, um, simulation can be very low cost. And the most important thing uh, is, is the people. And um, it is uh, very, very simple to, to, um, to train uh, people in uh, in any country developed or developing with, um, with a good scenario using uh, in situ simulation within their clinical environment. So we're not actually bringing them out of their environment into a high tech um, uh, setting where, um, where, where they're actually just going to go back to another environment where they don't have access to this, this, and this. So, so um, in situ simulation uh, and um, simulation um, enthusiasts, uh, such as the people uh, you know listening to this uh, uh, conference, can have a huge impact in actually improving um, healthcare in developing uh, settings. So, to to maximise the the resources uh, that they have available to them by focusing on okay, well, you don't have, you may not have that, but you have this, and this is what you can do uh, in your environment to, um, to improve patient safety. Amazing, wonderful. One last question for the sake of time uh, from Dr. Sami Thubeti. How do you view uh, the implementation of in situ simulation? Is it as a continuous curriculum-based or event-based uh, or event-driven sessions? Okay, well, basically, um, you, you can define either way. So I think you need to highlight a learning objective and then, um, then develop the, the program based on that. So for example, with the, um, uh, with the out of hospital uh, cardiac arrest sim, this started as a, um, 
as a single event to stress test the um, the response to a, a um, an out of hospital cardiac arrest within the hospital grounds. And it was realized that actually the learning that was a, was obtained for that team was so valuable that it became an ongoing program that was run with every new um, uh, batch of, of trainees um, that, that, that come through the system. So um, I don't think there's, there's a single answer and it really depends on the learning objectives that you want to uh, achieve. But um, remember that there is a turnover of staff. So often running the same scenario again can be immensely helpful. Amazing. Um, it is exactly nine o'clock and that brings us to the end of our session today. I would like again to thank our both uh, great speakers today for their um, amazing presentation and inspiring uh, ideas. And I would like to remind you uh, to join us tomorrow for our fourth day activity. Um, that's going to um, discuss or talk about difficult debriefing and how to design an effective simulation course. Uh, just to remind you, tomorrow's session will be starting at 6 instead of 7. So um, it's going to be a little bit earlier at 6 o'clock tomorrow. So uh, please join us. Uh, We'd like to have you there too. And uh, have a wonderful night. And thank you, everyone, um, the attendees, the panelists, um, and the organizing uh, committee for this amazing night. Thank you very much and have a wonderful day. And another reminder, please don't forget to do the evaluation at the end uh, when I close the webinar, uh, then the evaluation message will pop up. Thank you so much.